History plays a very important role in the development of the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt You can read a book a hundred times, but if your heart does not connect with the tragedy, then you will not benefit from it. The piece we are looking at here represents the land of Fedek. Historically, the land of Fedek was an area which was gifted to Rasulullah by the Jews of Khaybar after the Battle of Khaybar. And thus Fedek was a personal gift to Rasulullah. It was not considered of the spoils of war. Had it been the spoils of war, it would been, have divided uh, among the Muslims. But since it was a personal gift, it became the sole property of Rasulullah Sallallahu And as a gesture of generosity and as a gesture of honor, Rasulullah gifted the land of Fedek to his daughter Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. Of course, after the martyrdom of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the major events which took place was the taking or usurping of the land of Fedek from Fatima by the authorities at the time. Uh, Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam requested this piece of land be given back to her uh, but the authorities refused some details narrate that she began to request it using evidence the first evidence that she used was uh, that it was gifted to her that was denied because they asked her to bring witnesses um, and the witnesses that she brought were not sufficient for them. Then she claimed that it was inheritance. The opposition claimed that the prophets, according to the hadith, which was of course fabricated, uh, prophets do not inherit, they do not give inheritance. Uh, and thus, the land of Fadak was taken away from Fatima to Zahra wrongfully and unjustly. But the land of Fedek stands for something more than just a piece of land. If we read history, we find that uh, Imam Ali السلام, and Fatima al-Zahra owned many pieces of land. So, they were not fighting over a piece of land just because of, you know, it had monetary value or anything. Rather, Fatima al-Zahra knew that by defending her claim to the land of Fedek, and by them accepting her claim to the land of Fedek, then consequently they must also accept her other claims. And they knew that in the matter of Khilafah, she was not going to side with them, she was going to side with her husband and her Imam, and Imam Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. Salam. So, before reaching the point of her demanding the Khilafah for her husband, Amir al Mu'mineen, and her Imam, they usurped Fadak so that she would not have the right to further her claim. 
History also, also tells us many years later, uh, a dispute took place between the people of Medina, the people in the Islamic Empire, over uh, to whom Fedek shall be given to, to whom shall, shall it be rewarded to. So Harun al-Abbasi, the Khalifa of the time, uh, came to the seventh Imam, Imam Musa al-Kadhim salam, and he asked him to resolve the dispute. He gave him a, a piece of paper and a pen and he told him to draw the borders of the land of Fedek so that it could be rightfully returned to him because he was the heir and the inheritor of Fatima al zahra uh, The seventh Imam took the paper and the pen and he began drawing the borders of the entire Islamic empire at the time, from Yemen to the Northern Arabian P Peninsula uh, to, to Bahrain, the entire landmass of the Islamic empire at that time, and even further. So he returned it to the Khalifa, the Khalifa said, this is not Fedek, Fedek is a small piece of land. The Imam tells him, then you have misunderstood what Fedek is. Fedek is not a piece of land, Fedek stands for the Imam. And this is what Fatima al Zahra realized decades before that incident took place. So she was not fighting for a, something with a minute monetary value. She was fighting for the claim to Imama, uh, for her husband and her Imam, Al Imam Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. Masjid Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a very humble, very simple abode for Muslims to come to. Uh, it was a refuge for the young and the old, the rich and the poor, the black and the white, those who would enter the sanctuary of the Masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would feel comfort, would feel ease. The Prophet himself participated in the construction of this masjid, something which was very simple at the time, the pillars made from the trunks, palm trees, and the roof made from the leaves of the trees. Very simple setting, very simple design. And after the masjid was built, the family of Rasulullah and the companions of Rasulullah were honored and privileged to build their homes around the masjid. And each one of them had a door leading from their home into the masjid, very easy access. Rasulullah had a door, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam and Fatima al-Zahra had a door and other family members and companions. It is narrated that one day, Jibra'il told the Prophet, he commanded, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded that all doors which lead from the homes to the masjid should be closed except the door of Fatima al Zahra alayhi uh, salam. And, and this was a privilege granted only to Imam Ali and, and Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. It is narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for many days on end would stand at the door of Amir al muminin and Fatima alayhi salam and he would continue to recite the verse Inna ma yuridu Allah liyudhiba ankum al-rijsa ahl al-bayt wa yutahhirakum tadkhira and the reason he did this was very obvious today you find people who when reading this verse say that the ahl al-bayt in this verse the term Ahl al-Bayt refers to the wives of the Prophet. But the Prophet himself would stand exclusively at the door of Amir al muminin and Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam and he would recite this verse. What he was trying to say was that this verse is specific 
for these people, the ones who live inside this house. Verily, Allah wills to purify the household of the Prophet, the Ahlul Bayt Here we find the makeshift of the event which is referred to in the books of hadith, of narration, as Raziyatul Khamis. According to narrations, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, passed away on a Monday. This event took place on the Thursday before the Prophet passed away. The Prophet, during his final days, uh, because of his illness, frequently he would fall into a minor coma and he would, uh, he would then wake up. It is said that one day, on that Thursday, he woke up and he found his companions um, and some of his family members around him. So he ordered them to bring for him a pen and paper. Ituni bidawain wa qartas. Bring for me a pen and paper, he says, so that may, I may write something that if you were to follow the commands of what I write, the will, you will never go astray. Sahih al Bukhari mentions this narration in detail. One of the men, got up and said, Inna rajula layahjur. The man, Rasulullah, is hallucinating. The hadith itself does not say that Umar said the Prophet is hallucinating. However, it says that the group of people who were there among them was Umar. And then after the Prophet requested that they bring the uh, pen and paper and after they refused him, he, uh, the, the descent took place. Some of them, the hadith says, were agreeing with Rasulullah, and some of them were agreeing with Umar, which tells us that the Prophet said something and Umar ibn al-Khattab said something else. And so the conflict took place. The hadith continues to mention their voices were raised, physical threats were made. Upon witnessing this, Rasulullah turned to them and he told them, Qumu anni, leave my room, leave my presence. It is not befitting that you conflict among yourselves and fight amongst the Apostle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abdullah ibn Abbas, a very young man at the time who narrates this hadith, for many years later, any time he would mention the calamity of Thursday, he would say a calamity and what kind of calamity took place. Some ahadith say that when he would narrate the hadith, he would weep so much that his beard would be drenched in his tears. So, I mean, this tells us that, that it was not something very simple, just a simple disagreement with Rasulullah. It was, it was very important. It was something very serious. Unfortunately, Upon the deathbed of Rasulullah, these people disagreed and said, we don't need the words of Rasulullah, all we need is the Qur'an. Saqifat bin Sa'idah speaks of the meeting point where those who, after the martyrdom of the Prophet, tried to secure the position of Khilafah for themselves. Many of the companions had the intention of appointing one of themselves as the Caliph, the successor, after Rasulullah. Despite the many orders and commands throughout the lifetime of the Prophet, where he explicitly directed that 
his cousin and his son-in-law, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali alayhi salam, be the successor after his martyrdom. The first people who tried to secure the Khilafah for themselves were the Ansar, the helpers, those who received and welcomed Rasulullah when he migrated from Mecca to Medina. And the leader of the Ansar was Sa'ad ibn Abada. Sa'ad, along with some of his family members and tribe members, sought to secure the position of Khilafah for himself. And they did this deliberately because they recognized that there were people who were more deserving of this title than them, namely the Muhajireen, the emigrants, those who migrated with Rasulullah. And among the Muhajireen, most importantly, were Banu Hashim, the relatives of Rasulullah. And so while this deliberation was taking place, two people, they found Abu Bakr ibn Abi Quhafa and Umar ibn al-Khattab and Abu Ubaid al-Jarrah. They learned of this plot, so they took them to the Saqifa. And so both sides began to conflict among each other. The Ansar said that they were more deserving. The Muhajireen said that they were more deserving because of what they had witnessed with the Prophet, because they were the first to accept Islam. So again, conflict took place. So there was much dissension. Uh, in the end, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab took the hand of Abu Bakr and he pledged allegiance to him. Uh, thus, other people began to uh, pledge allegiance to him. Mind you that a lot of people were left out of this process. The most important of them was Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali alayhi salam. If, if there was anyone whose opinion was important, it was Amir al-Mu'mineen. And after the deliberation took place, Abu Bakr was chosen as Khalifa and martial law was implemented in, in all of Medina. So people began to uh, pledge allegiance to Abu Bakr. The rule of Abu Bakr was enforced brutally by people such as Umar ibn al-Khattab, Khalid ibn al-Walid, Al-Mughira ibn Shu'ba. And after uh, securing the allegiance here, they knew that they would have to secure the allegiance of the most important, the closest people to Rasulullah himself, and that was Banu Hashim. And it was after this that they came to the home of Fatima al-Zahra Not too long after the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after the Khilafah was wrongfully given to those who did not deserve it and who were not appointed by Rasulullah, they came after the election process, they came to the door of Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam in order to secure the allegiance of Banu Hashim. The narration state that a group of up to 4,000 men came to the door of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam and they demanded that Amir al-Mu'mineen come out and pledge allegiance to Abu Bakr. Of course, Amir al-Mu'mineen knew that he was the rightful successor to Rasulullah and also narrations tell us that at that time Amir al-Mu'mineen was busy with preparing the final copy of the Quran as he had heard it from Rasulullah in the order that he had taken it from Rasulullah so he did not come out to uh, give allegiance to Abu Bakr at this time 
and this is also narrated in, in the Ahlul Sunnah books of Hadith, they came, the army of men, leading them was Umar ibn al-Khattab, and he demanded from Fatima to Zahra that Ali ibn Abi Talib come out and pledge allegiance, and he said that if he does not come out, we will burn down this house. And they brought with them the uh, wood in order to burn down the house. They came out, some of them, they said that the daughter of the Prophet Fatima to Zahra السلام, is in this home. He says, what in? So what if she is in the home? We will burn it down in order to secure the allegiance of Abu Bakr and narrations tell us that this is exactly what they did. They set fire to the home of Fatima to Zahra, the home of the purest people, the closest people to Rasulullah <laughs> of attackers came to the door of Amir al-Mu'mineen after setting fire to the door this is where the great tragedy takes place they kick the door in Fatima alayhi salam was caught between the wall and the door and from the door there was a a nail which was sticking out and this nail stabbed her in her ribs and they began to push her, they began to squeeze her between the door and the wall until they broke her rib. This also led to her miscarrying her infant, miscarrying her baby in her womb, Al-Muhassin or Al-Muhsin. Place of worship of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. When Fatima alayhi salam was on her deathbed, she had instructed Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam to prepare her and to bury her in the darkness of the night. And she instructed that no one attend except for a handful, a trusted few. Those who attended were, of course, Amir al-Mu'mineen himself, Al-Hasan, Al-Hussein, uh, Ammar ibn Yasir, Salman al-Muhammadi, and a couple of other loyal, close companions. She did not want to be buried in broad daylight. And she did not want her place of burial to be known either. Till today, we do not know exactly where Fatima to Zahra is buried. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, a man who, according to all Muslims during the battle of Khaybar, lifted the gates of Khaybar with one hand, a job which 70 men combined could not do, did not find the strength to lift the lifeless body of Fatima to Zahra السلام, After washing her pure body and preparing her for burial, he sat in, in the corner and he began to weep.
as you can see, a nighttime burial where only a handful of people participated. Maytham al-Tammar, one of the loyal companions of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, a man who today is buried uh, close to Masjid al-Kufa after the martyrdom of the Prophet and after the martyrdom of Fatima al-Zahra, he accompanied Imam Ali alayhi salam, a man of very simple means but very loyal. And what is interesting about this man is that Amir al-Mu'mineen himself told him that Maytham, one day you will be killed defending me and fighting for me. And he even showed him the tree where he would be crucified. He took him to the tree and he said, this is the tree where after they kill you, they will crucify you here. Maytham and Tamar out of enthusiasm and out of undying loyalty it is said that after Amir al-Mu'mineen showed him that tree he would visit it frequently and he would give it water and he would take care of it. He knew his place of death and he embraced it. He embraced it because he knew that he was going to die the death of a virtuous man. This is something which as, as Muslims and as followers of Ahlul Bayt السلام, we would want for ourselves. Imagine if, if the Imam of our time, for instance, tells me, Fulan, you are going to die fighting for me. Nothing in this world will matter anymore. Such was the case with Maytham al-Tammar, a very loyal companion. Maytham al-Tammar, uh, by profession, uh, would sell dates. Uh, it is said that one day, <clears throat> as he was selling dates, his master, Amir al-Mu'mineen, came to him. And so Maytham had to run uh, a few errands. He had to leave his stand. Uh, and so he had Amir al-Mu'mineen stand and sell dates on his behalf. So. While Maytham was gone, a man came to purchase dates from Amir al-Mu'mineen. Uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen provided him with, with the dates, the man provided him with the money. When Maytham came back, he found that the currency that the man had given to Amir al-Mu'mineen was defective. So he told him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, why did you accept this currency? It is defective. So Amir al-Mu'mineen told him to have patience. Uh, soon after, the man came back and he turned to Amir al-Mu'mineen and he said, why did you sell me dates which were defective? So Amir al-Mu'mineen tried to teach a very simple, harmless lesson um, through this gesture. Bayt al-Ahzan was a makeshift place which was constructed by Amir al-Mu'mineen after the martyrdom of Rasulullah. It was a place where Fatima alayhi salam would seek refuge in. This is where she would weep and lament. Uh, the reason being is because Fatima after the death, after the martyrdom of Rasulullah would weep so often and so frequently that uh, those people who were not loyal to the Prophet, were not loyal to Ahlul Bayt السلام, would complain. They would say, Ya Ali, your wife is crying too much. She is weeping too much. Take her out of Medina. Imagine the daughter of Rasulullah, few days after he is martyred, is expelled from Medina. Why? Because she wants to lament her father. She wants to mourn and weep for him. So, Amir al-Mu'mineen constructed a makeshift home which was not really a house, rather it was constructed out of a palm tree um, in order for her to see, sit under and mourn the death of the Prophet. 
And even then, they did not allow the mourning to take place. They destroyed Bayt al-Ahzan. They wanted to destroy the memory of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Imam Al-Hasan, Al-Imam Zain Al-Abideen, Al-Imam Al-Baqir and Al-Imam Al-Sadiq, the second, fourth, fifth and sixth Imams of the school of Ahlul Bayt, along with Fatima bint Asad, the mother of Amir Al-Mu'mineen, uh, Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, uh, the sons of Rasulullah who passed away during their infancy, Umm uh, Al-Baneen, the mother of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, the wife of Amir al-Mu'mineen, as well as other loyal companions, all buried in this place. Nowadays, the followers and the lovers of Ahl al-Bayt do not have the privilege of visiting them freely. Not only were the lives of these Imams taken unjustly, the injustice continues because we as their followers and their lovers cannot visit them freely. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of the 12th Imam so that we may one day visit them. Say, Mohammed.